at last, the amazing authentic story of Jack the Ripper, the unknown killer whose mass murders shocked the world. The actual cases in the actual setting. London, a city torn apart by fear and hate as the mob howled for the blood of the human monster Scotland Yard could never catch. Hi, I'm Simon Ford. If you believe the movies, at least that one from 1959, all the London police did from 1888 onwards was hunt Jack the Ripper. But it wasn't like that at all. Violent crime was rife in the capital and many murders, not just those committed by Jack, went unsolved. We're going to look at two of them and ask our resident homicide expert Jack Morell two questions. One, were they linked? And if so, two, did the perpetrator get away with murder twice? Let me bring in one of Psycho Killer's super sleuths, Pip Watts, with murder number one. Thanks, Simon. I've been called a few things in my time, but never a super sleuth. Well, compared to Jack, we're all amateurs. Anyway, let me tell you about the Kentish Town Milk Shop murder of 1887. Nowadays, Kentish Town NW5 is a hip and happening place, about a 10-minute walk from Camden Market. First, the Paddington Canal, then the railways, brought prosperity to this part of London. And it was here, at 92 Bartholomew Road, that Mr David Samuel and his wife Louisa kept a milk shop. The building itself has gone, and the Garibaldi pub on the corner with Islip Street is a convenience store. But otherwise, you get a good idea of what an upmarket, leafy area this was in the late 1880s. And right now, a one-bedroom apartment on Bartholomew Road sells for half a million pounds, or about 625,000 US dollars. David Samuel was a robust fellow in his late 60s. But Louisa, though just 57, was deaf and in poor health. On Friday the 11th of March 1887, David set out on his milk round, leaving Louisa to mind the shop. It was about 20 past three in the afternoon. What happened next is the subject of conjecture, because there were no eyewitnesses. Mrs Boone, the Samuels lodger, was the closest. She was in her room over the stable yard, but even so, she told the police she heard nothing. Now, Mr Samuel used to keep the takings in a heavy old safe on one of the shelves in the shop. It seems that Louisa became aware of a commotion in the shop. She came running in from the back parlour to see two or three men trying to jemmy open the safe. They'd managed to get it down onto the floor, but they couldn't get it open. The thieves abandoned the safe and fled but not before one of them hit Louisa over the head with a crowbar or similar blunt instrument. The gang then jumped into a pony cart and drove off, leaving Louisa unconscious and bleeding heavily. Carl Cooper has been looking at accounts of what happened next. A little girl called Alice Cooper, no relation I should add, found Mrs Samuel about half an hour later. Alice screamed and ran out into the street, where she told 16-year-old Harriet Barnbrook that Mrs Samuel was asleep on the floor. Harriet took one look inside the shop and ran to the Garibaldi pub for help. The landlord, Alexander Lydgate, sent for a doctor and the police. Soon, Superintendent Huntley and Detective Inspector Dodd were at the scene, and so were two local doctors. Incredibly, Louisa Samuel was clinging to life. An ambulance took her to University College Hospital on Euston Road, where surgeons shaved her scalp. It was immediately obvious she had catastrophic head injuries, causing extensive brain damage. Mrs Samuel never came out of a coma. She died at 20 minutes past midnight on Saturday the 12th of March. Mr Samuel told the police he'd gone out at 3.20, expecting to be home by 4.30pm. He owned several houses in the area, as well as the milk shop, and often had a tidy sum in the safe, maybe 40 or 50 pounds. 
but he'd been to the bank and there was just a fiver in there in change. But to give you an idea of value, £5 in 1887 is equivalent in purchasing power to £700 today. So potentially the contents of the safe could have been 10 times that amount. What do you make of the story so far, Jack? Well, keeping an open mind, of course, this appears to be a burglary gone wrong. A business premises where a large amount of cash was likely to be stored in a safe. We've got a middle-aged woman alone on the premises. Whether this involved a single offender or several, they probably expected Louisa Samuel to do as she was told. It's then about how they dealt with her when she resisted. Why did the gang kill Louisa Samuel despite leaving empty-handed? Well, it appears that the offenders intended to access the contents of the safe whilst on the premises. After all, this is mid-March, so there's probably an hour or more daylight left. It's Friday afternoon, people are about. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. Had they been watching the shop and knew David Samuel was out, it's possible and would be a line of inquiry. That said, David was not a young man and maybe they expected whoever was in the shop to do as they were told. If there was more than one offender though, of course, there had to be some planning involved. Did they have intelligence about the milk shop and the fact large sums of cash were kept in a safe? And where might this information have come from? Well, I've seen the result of loose talk in pubs, where people are envious of those they perceive to be wealthy. Samuel sold milk, a staple commodity, purchased on a regular basis as an essential item. Everyone in the local community would know how much the Samuels were worth. Bad news travels fast. On Sunday the 13th of March, hundreds of people gathered on Bartholomew Road to gawp at the scene of the murder. Local residents and tradesmen were nervous. Would they be next? And what were the police doing about catching these bloodthirsty robbers? It must have been with some relief that detectives took the statement of 13-year-old Charles Shakespeare. Young Charlie had seen a man jump into a pony cart in which two other men were waiting outside number 92 during that fatal hour. The cart had been dark brown with a box body and the pony was chestnut in colour. The men were in their early to mid-twenties, smartly dressed with billycock hats. The cart turned sharp left onto Islip Street by the Garibaldi pub and sped off towards Kentish Town. What do you think, Jack? Were these the villains leaving the scene of the murder? Well, the timing is certainly relevant. How reliable is this young witness? Assuming he is competent and is accurate with his descriptions, what detail is there that can help identify suspects? Is there anything that stands out in those descriptions? I'm not familiar with the 1880s, but from what Pip has just said, I would say not. The descriptions are very general, and the headgear probably typical of most people in that period. The vehicle used was a pony cart with a box body. Now all that is probably the 1880 equivalent of three figures wearing baseball caps and driving off in a dark coloured hatchback. It's a start, but that kind of information needs to be handled with care. Does it need to be publicised at this point? Sure, there needs to be an appeal for information about suspicious activity, but the descriptions of the men in the car, I'm not so sure. Yes, I agree. I'm not sure how useful they were. Members of the public came forward in response to an appeal for information, and what they said was inconsistent. One witness had seen three men driving a pony cart in the vicinity of number 92 on one of the days before the murder. The men were respectable looking, but the horse was shaggy with a long tail. Another witness saw two men in a long-bodied, dark red cart pulled by a bay pony. The men were 30 to 40 years old and heavily built. Oh, and the cart had the number 15 painted on it so it could have been rented. A third witness saw three young men travelling in a very shabby box cart pulled by a shaggy brown pony with a very long mane and tail. Somebody else saw a pony cart with three men in it speeding down the city road, about three miles away from the murder scene. Jack, how would you go about analysing this evidence? That doesn't surprise me. All those witnesses may have been genuinely trying to help, but what have they added to the case? If the appeal had specifically mentioned a pony cart, did it distract the public? After all, 
If the Samuel place had been visited in days before the murder, it only needed one person on foot to check the premises, maybe to buy some milk. I remember a case I worked on when, in good faith, the police initially appealed for sightings of a dark-coloured hatchback, and this resulted in so many sightings that it was impossible to deal with them all, and it actually muddied the waters. That said, the cart with the number 15 was a viable line of inquiry. There's a chance that any hirers of carts with that number could be traced, interviewed and eliminated. The inquest into Louisa Samuel's death opened at University College Hospital on the 15th of March, before Mr George Danford Thomas, the coroner for Central Middlesex. Simon's been looking at reports of the hearing. David Samuel described how he'd been around the corner on Islip Street when a little girl, probably Alice Cooper, called to him saying his safe was on the shop floor and his wife was lying in a pool of blood. Mr Samuel found Louisa unconscious, as the girl described, with more blood oozing from her head. At this point, neither Mr Samuel nor Harriet Barnbrook recalled seeing a pony cart. Alexander Lydgate, the landlord of the Garibaldi, had just come home in a cab and it seems the two men arrived at 92 Bartholomew Street at almost the same time. They lay Louisa on a sofa and her husband rubbed brandy into her gums to try to revive her. Lydgate's cabbie drove to King's Cross Police Station where he spoke to Constable Standish Harris. When Harris arrived at number 92, Mrs Samuel was comatose and he sent for an ambulance. Inspector Frederick Summers had also arrived at the scene. He and Constable Harris collected statements, including one from Charles Shakespeare about the three men in the pony cart, but they couldn't find the murder weapon. Detective Inspector Dodd told the inquest they were making inquiries, but nobody had been arrested. The foreman of the jury suggested a reward should be offered, and the coroner promised to refer this suggestion to the proper quarter. We know a thing or two about rewards, don't we, Jack? We do indeed. I've seen it work well on a few occasions. But equally, a public appeal with a reward can lead to chances seeing an opportunity to make suggestions based on rumours at best. What the offer of a reward does is invite somebody to be a criminal informant. Those in the criminal underworld, or at least people with useful information, are those who'd not previously felt the compunction to tell the police about. To now do so for financial gain, like with any criminal informants, there's also a risk of deliberate harm through misinformation, putting the heat on a criminal rival, maybe. The inquest was adjourned until the 29th of March, and D.I. Dodd and his team redoubled their efforts to find the pony cart, speculating that if the villain still had it, they might be planning further robberies. Is that what you'd have done, Jack? Well, yes, the tracing of the cart seen leaving the scene was a priority, but clearly poses some difficulty. Carts would appear to change hands on a regular basis, and unlike modern-day vehicles, they don't have a unique registration mark. Of course, behind the scenes, there would be efforts to identify recent crime trends, to ask questions of gangs or individuals known to be active. By a stroke of luck, the morning after the murder... Three men were seen driving suspiciously slowly through the streets of Westminster. When challenged by a police constable, they ran away. Inside the cart, hidden under blankets, was a large iron safe. Had the Kentish Town gang done another job within hours of murdering Louisa Samuel? The constable gave a good description of the three men, but they were never caught. Today, Westminster is about five miles from Kentish Town, although the roads are very different, and the traffic is motorised. Even so, is it beyond the bounds of possibility this could have been the same gang, Jack? Quite possibly. I'd be interested to know how many safes were stolen across London that year, whether by burglary or robbery. Was there the 19th century equivalent of the Flying Squad, maybe? Well, the Met set up the so-called Flying Squad in 1919 in response to criminals using motor cars to strike quickly and escape pursuing police. The Sweeney wasn't around in 1887, although a few years later the Commissioner started issuing bicycles as an effective way of beating the traffic and catching crooks. In the meantime, the inquest into Louisa Samuel's death resumed on the 29th of March, and the jury returned a verdict 
of murder against some person or persons unknown. The police investigation made little headway. Various miscreants were pulled in. Some had pony carts, others didn't. None of them could be linked to the milk shop murder. On the 11th of May, Charles Seymour, a drunken sailor in Portsmouth, confessed to the police that he and two other unnamed men had gone up to London and committed the crime. But he withdrew his confession when he sobered up and he was discharged by the police court. A week later, another drunk, Charles Wheeler, gave himself up, but the following morning retracted his confession, saying he'd been on the drink and needed a bed for the night. I suppose both these characters wanted to spend a night in the drunk tank, even if it meant confessing to murder. That sounds about right. I wish I had an amusing anecdote from my experience, but I'm afraid these false claims are another regular drain on officer time. They can't be ignored, despite often coming from intoxicated individuals who aren't lucid. You can imagine them, can't you? A patrol officer being the recipient of rambling and fanciful claims. Claims, though, that could be true. Who deals with the aftermath if they are ignored? I do know of a case where two separate murder investigations were blighted by the vague confession of a man whose claims could have fitted both murders. And by the time his confession, if you want to call it that, was retracted, the officers from the first case had concluded that he'd nothing to do with it. And by the time the case was solved and went to court, the defence had a ready-made scenario to play their game of smoke and mirrors. Well, to be honest, this case was looking like it would never get to court. Having drawn a blank in the capital, Detective Inspector Dodd decided to cast his net further afield. When he reeled it in, the net contained a couple of young scoundrels from Rochdale in Lancashire, calling themselves George Smith and John Jones. They'd been arrested going from shop to shop in a pony cart, asking to change a sovereign into silver doubtless to spy on where the cash was kept. They denied being anywhere near London on the 11th of March, but, undeterred, Dodd went up to Rochdale with young Charlie Shakespeare and another witness, hoping to get a positive identification. Alas, Smith and Jones were not the men they'd seen in the pony cart. And with that, despite the protestations of the London papers, the investigation was wound down. So, what conclusions can we draw about the murder of Louisa Samuel? The crime writer Jan Bonderson proposes some theories, but will they stand up to the Jack Morell test? Jack, number one. It was clearly murder for plunder, or as we might say, a robbery gone wrong. Is that a reasonable conclusion based on the available evidence? Probably. And I'm sure those... Background inquiries into the people close to the Samuels revealed no other motive. OK, can we reasonably say that there were three criminals, young men in their early 20s, who were respectably dressed in dark clothes? This relies on evidence of one witness, Charles Shakespeare. We have no reason to doubt what he said, and three offenders would be a realistic number. One in charge of the cart, and two to do the theft. One of them is prone to violence, for sure. Right, gotcha. Next point. The robbery had been planned with some degree of local knowledge, which points to the gang being local rather than out of town. What do you make of that theory? What evidence is there of reconnaissance? None, really. What knowledge is needed other than the location and optimum timing? Friday afternoon was probably the best option, with up to a week's takings, and the shop being quieter in the afternoon, maybe. This robbery could have been more spontaneous than initially thought. Those milk shops were probably on every high street. Yes, you're absolutely right, and we're going to hear about another one shortly. In the meantime, can we assume that the robbers were inexperienced, as shown by their failed attempt to open the safe, or carry it out to the pony cart, if there ever was a pony cart? Not sure about the inexperienced tag. This type of crime is never sophisticated. It just needed a few like-minded criminal thugs with an hour to spare. Maybe the safe was surprisingly bigger than a typical shop safe. If that was the case, their prior knowledge wasn't that good. Maybe they expected the shopkeeper to open it willingly. Maybe there was tension within the gang. Maybe one of them was getting more unpredictable and more violent. You don't need experience in these crimes. You just need a callous disregard for others. 
Miss Lucy Clark trained as a dressmaker before becoming a lady's maid to the Countess of Lonsdale. She held the position for many years before moving to London, where she started her own dressmaking business at 86 George Street, Marylebone, where she also had an apartment. And very successful she was too. In 1888, Lucy Clark had £300 in the bank and some valuable gold jewellery. That £300 would be worth more than £42,000 in today's money. On Sunday the 15th of January 1888, Miss Clark went to worship at the Portman Chapel before visiting a coffee house on King Street. This was in 1888 and still is today a very smart part of town between Piccadilly and Pall Mall. Lucy lived alone without any servants and it's entirely possible her groceries came from Fortnum and Mason, unquestionably the oldest department store in London. Her milk, however, came from the building next door, where Mr Thomas, a milkman, had his shop. Yes, you heard correctly, a milk shop. Mr Thomas didn't see his neighbour for several days after that Sunday, which was odd, because she had regular habits and usually came down for a pint of milk in the morning. On the 23rd of January, a letting agent, William Betts, came to show clients around a vacant apartment at 86 George Street. Betts went upstairs to unlock and collect the mail, but at the front of the staircase he saw the corpse of Lucy Clark, surrounded by a large pool of congealed blood. It transpired that Miss Clark had been dead for three to four days. She'd been repeatedly struck around the head with a blunt instrument, shattering her skull, and her throat was slashed from ear to ear. Her assailant was clearly violent and powerful. An inquest was opened. Lucy's brother Francis, a stonemason who lived on Woolworth Road, testified he had last seen his sister on the 8th of January. Her money was kept in the bank, he said, but she had a considerable collection of gold jewellery at home. The police found several empty jewellery boxes, although the flat didn't appear to have been ransacked. Two gold rings were found on the floor and some securities and a bank book were left in a drawer, suggesting, according to Jan Bonderson, that the thief or thieves were hardly professionals. What do you think, Jack? Was this an amateur job or was the burglar disturbed? Well, what we know so far doesn't allow us to make a judgment on the offender's profile, let alone the interpretation of the scene. In today's world, that scene would be examined over a period of days. The crime scene manager would be looking to explain whether the search of the flat came after the brutal attack or before. The transfer of blood to other objects or items. Was the attack on her at a low level or was she standing? Was there more than one offender? Lucy Clark came from a large family. As well as her brother Francis, she had a sister Elizabeth and another sister Francis, who was married to a baker and grocer, Sidney Mees. Frances Mees told the police her sister was a very respectable lady. She looked younger than her 49 years and had recently contemplated marriage, although she wasn't in a relationship at the time. A Mrs Gower, who shared the flat with Lucy until a few months prior, said her roommate was always happy and cheerful, although she noticed Lucy kept forgetting to lock the front door. Indeed, there was no sign of forced entry. The question remained, was Lucy Clark murdered by an opportunist who panicked or by someone who knew her? For once, the London police had evidence pointing to a clear-cut suspect, Lucy's ne'er-do-well nephew, Henry Montague Chadwick. Detectives found a copy of a letter Miss Clark had sent to him, dated Saturday the 13th of January 1888. This is a mistake, actually. Saturday was the 14th, so the letter was possibly sent on Friday the 13th. This is what it said. Harry, I am waiting an answer from you to know what is your intention, to pay for the damage you did to my gold chain, and to make good the other things you have stolen from me. I have taken my chain to a jeweller, but you have broken and twisted it so badly, and one piece you have broken off... He cannot mend it for less than seven shillings and sixpence, and the double ring of the same quality would be ten shillings. I think the actions you did was that of a villain. 
You know I had it in my power to make you pay one way or another, so you had better let me know if you wish to do so from your own free will. The letter was signed L. Clark. What do you make of it, Jack? Well, Lucy Clark is clearly a woman of high moral fibre who doesn't take kindly to anyone not doing the right thing. I can see why the timing of the letter was of interest. Harry would have received it early in the week that she was killed. I wonder what were the circumstances of the chain being damaged in the first place. She describes him as a villain. Is there a history of him stealing or not paying debts to her? Was there a previous violent struggle? What was in their relationship that allows Lucy to hint at blackmail? Harry lived with his widowed mother. Elizabeth Clark, Lucy's sister, had married a London butler called Henry James Chadwick in 1862. They had three living children, Henry Montague and Walter James, born in 1866 and 1867 respectively, and a daughter, Evelyn, born in 1868. It appears the father died in 1883, which explained in part why his widow and their grown-up children were all living at the same address, 78 Gloucester Street, Pimlico. Harry was an architect's clerk and had no police record. Walter, on the other hand, was an idle, work-shy fellow who scraped by on handouts from his mother and his older brother. Detective Inspector George Robson was in charge of the murder inquiry. He questioned Harry, who denied quarrelling with Lucy, until he was shown the letter from the 13th of January. He then admitted that a few weeks earlier, his aunt had been unwell. She'd stayed with her sister in Pimlico, but she left her cat behind at the flat on George Street. Since her roommate had moved out, there was nobody to look after the cat, and so Lucy had given the keys to Harry and Walter so that they could feed it. It's about an hour's walk from Gloucester Street in Pimlico to George Street, Marylebone. The route was studded with public houses. By the time Harry and Walter arrived at Aunt Lucy's flat, they were by far the worse for drink and had decided to steal some jewellery to pay for more booze. They took two gold stoppers which they sold to a pawnbroker, but in the process they damaged them and they also ruined a valuable net chain, as mentioned in the letter. The record doesn't show if they remembered to feed the cat. Things didn't look good for the brothers at the inquest. The two young Chadwicks looked shifty and evasive. They claimed to be 21 and 19 years old, respectively. Their birth certificates showed that Harry was nearly 22 and Walter was 20. Harry's denial that he'd quarrelled with his aunt was exposed as a lie. Walter couldn't explain how, after the murder, he was able to get the train to Stratford and pay five shillings in a club there. He'd been out of work for more than a year and his mother had refused to give him any pocket money. Nor could he remember which days he'd visited his aunt in December and January. A pawnbroker had seen a young man pawn a watch of the same make as Lucy's, but he couldn't pick out either of the Chadwick brothers in an identity parade. Despite some loaded remarks from the coroner and public sentiment being generally against Harry and Walter Chadwick, the inquest jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons at present unknown. There was uproar in the press, with the Lloyd's Weekly newspaper expressing the view that the police should have been given more time to collect evidence against the two young Chadwicks, the main murder suspects. As it was, no charges were brought, and Harry Chadwick had the audacity to tell the Echo... It is a sad and shocking affair indeed, but next to my poor aunt, I think we are the most unfortunate people in the transaction, for we have unjustly suffered the risk of a dreadful imputation. The police made no further progress, and the investigation into Lucy Clark's murder fizzled out. Just a quick one, Jack. Is it true that murder investigations really are never closed? Of course, they are never closed until every suspect has been charged and either convicted or acquitted. Well, the police might have given up, but not so the campaigning London newspapers, with the Penny Illustrated asking, Where are the perpetrators of the fiendish murder of Mrs Samuel, the wife of the milk shop keeper in Kentish Town? 
Where lurk the great Coram Street, Burton Crescent and Euston Square murderers? It is earnestly to be hoped that this black list of murderers at large will not be added the men or women concerned in the brutal assassination of Miss Lucy Clark. It would be three years before answers began to emerge and even then the long arm of the law wasn't quite long enough. Walter James Chadwick quit London and headed north. In 1890 and 91, he was living at Hume in Manchester with a Louisa Davies. She was a prostitute, and Chadwick, who changed his name to Walter Frederick from Walter James, was living off immoral earnings. Their relationship was abusive. Chadwick was controlling and oozed violence. He threatened Louisa, but he'd met his match. In April 1891, Louisa went to the police and reported him, saying her life was in danger. Why? Because on more than one occasion, Chadwick had told her in detail about a murder he'd committed. If he was trying to intimidate her, it backfired spectacularly. Chadwick was arrested and went before Manchester City Police Court. Louisa Davis swore on oath that Chadwick told her about a time when he and two other thieves had once staked out a house and milk shop in Kentish Town, London, in 1887. They smashed the old woman who confronted them before making their getaway in a pony cart. Chadwick added callously, she would have died anyway, as it was in the papers she died of heart disease. Louisa Davis added that Chadwick also told her how he'd been accused of murdering his aunt, Lucy Clark. The charges were dismissed, but Chadwick added he had a good idea who'd actually committed the murder. All this was too much. Chadwick jumped to his feet and exclaimed to the examining magistrate, Do you, sir, think any man in his right senses would make such a statement to a woman of the witness's character? The magistrate replied coolly that this was a matter for the jury to decide. Turning to Miss Davis, Chadwick demanded, Did I make such a statement to you? Yes, replied Louisa calmly, many times, adding that Chadwick had been sober and thus he had distinctly said he himself had struck the blow at Mrs Samuel. Asked why she hadn't gone to the police sooner, Louisa Davis said she had been in fear of her life. Chadwick had pushed her to the edge and she had no other means of escape. The Manchester and London papers were full of it. Journalists were certain Louisa Davies was telling the truth. Two brutal, unsolved crimes were about to be cleared up at a stroke, but it was not to be. The police court proceedings resumed on the 24th of March. Inspector Miller of the Metropolitan Police declared that the two witnesses he'd brought with him, young men who'd seen the three men in the cart after Mrs Samuel's murder, hadn't been able to pick out Chadwick from a lineup. There was a razor that Chadwick asked a barber to sharpen for him. The name Clark was scratched into both sides, and somebody had tried to erase the name. Was this the blade used to slash Lucy Clark's throat from ear to ear? Had Chadwick murdered his aunt? There was no way to know for sure, and after calling his heels for an extra couple of days on remand, Chadwick was discharged. Jack, do you agree with the court's decision not to proceed? Well, that was then, I suppose. The court made the right decision with the evidence as it was presented. How much work went into the interviews with Louisa Davis? And was there any corroboration to her account? Her reliability was always going to be put to the test. Did she disclose any of this information in confidence to a friend or relative, maybe even a client? Did Walter brag about his reputation just to Louisa, or did he make similar claims to others down the pub? With the right amount of work, these unreliable witnesses can often come across very well in court. They say things as it is, and despite their bad character, they can be very convincing. Was she using it as revenge? Well, there are easier ways for her to do that. Hiring a few local thugs to sort Walter out would have been far easier. The importance of Louisa explaining what he said 
and the words he used are important too. The question would be, was there anything he said that wasn't already in the public domain? Walter Chadwick used his reputation to control and threaten Louisa. These claims were made, it seems, during heated arguments and probably in drink. Without corroboration, though, these claims were never going to stand up in court. History doesn't record what happened to Walter Chadwick after 1891. Jan Bonderson suggests he changed his name to carry on with his life of crime. Or maybe he realised he'd had one close shave too many and went straight. Or he might have gone abroad to another part of the sprawling Victorian Empire. Canada, Australia and South Africa were all popular choices for a young man in need of a fresh start. In contrast, Harry Chadwick spiralled into a life of crime. He was sentenced to six years penal servitude in 1889 for demanding money with menaces. After his release in 1895, he got a job as a clerk with forged references and then proceeded to defraud his employer out of £1,500. But he was rumbled and was soon back behind bars, this time for five years. Harry was in and out of prison until 1902. Then in 1905, he married a 48-year-old widow, Ada Louise Chalice, in Lambeth. They moved to West Norwood, but Harry wasn't destined for a long and happy marriage. On the 13th of November 1906, he took his own life by swallowing potassium cyanide. He was just 40 years old. We're coming to the end of our tale, but before Jack gives us his final analysis, I'd like to throw something into the pot. Jan Bonderson mentions in passing that Lucy Clark's building, 86 George Street, Marylebone, was next door to a milk shop. Could there be a connection with the attempted robbery and murder at 92 Bartholomew Road? Was milk somehow the link? This question led me down something of a rabbit hole where I discovered lots of unexpected things. The milk trade in Victorian London was a hotbed of chicanery and malpractice. The milk itself came from two sources, registered cow sheds with small herds of cattle in the city itself and from the surrounding countryside via the railways. Urban cattle plagues like rinderpest and foot and mouth reduced the number of urban cow sheds, but there was still plenty in the 1880s and the London County Council was concerned about standards of hygiene, or, to be blunt, the alarming lack of it. Milk was sour, dirty and adulterated. In the 1890s, infant mortality spiked due to so-called summer diarrhoea, a consequence of babies being fed infected milk. The milk that was sold on the streets was also so watered down it was known as skim, because there was no cream in it and a bunch of unmentionable things besides. The milk that arrived from out of town fared no better. Wholesale, fresh country milk entered an unregulated retail network run by greedy, unscrupulous middlemen. There are parallels today where a product in high demand arrives in pure form and is repeatedly diluted and adulterated as it passes down the supply chain with each middleman taking a cut. The distribution network employed hundreds of people and was a grapevine buzzing with information, the kind of information that's useful to the criminally minded. Information that people will pay for, no questions asked. Information like, where old man Samuel keeps his cash, and that Mr Thomas, who keeps a milk shop at George Street, Marleybone, lives next door to a rich spinster who's in the habit of leaving her door unlocked. Everybody was trying to make a few extra pennies, from the carters who drove the churns across London to the children who'd watch the horses during deliveries. Is it possible that young Charles Shakespeare, the lad who got a good look at the Kentish Town Gang, was actually minding their pony and cart outside 92 Bartholomew Road? We will never know any more than we will never really know the identity of Louisa Samuels and Lucy Clark's killers. Well, if you're right, I can certainly see how such a network might benefit the criminal fraternity. And it's an attractive theory you have there. Criminal networks and the milk supply chain in Victorian London 
Sounds like a research paper in the making. Maybe you should apply for funding. But no, from a copper's point of view, there isn't enough evidence to support the theory. What we do know is that in Victorian London, there was a lot of crime and racketeering. Burglary and theft was rife. It didn't need much organising. It just needed some dishonest men with time on their hands and not enough money for their next session in the pub. So did Walter Chadwick murder Louisa Samuels and Lucy Clark? There's nothing to link him with the murder of Louisa Samuels, is there? He was a drinker, a thief, and he had a violent temper. He used the notoriety of the milk shop case to boost his reputation. Lucy Clark's murder is different. He is, in today's parlance, a significant person of interest. If he wasn't involved directly with her murder, he probably knew who was. Did he set her up by talking to another villain in the pub? Did he spout off about his nasty rich aunt and suggest that somebody burgle her place and knock her about a bit? These things, sadly, happen. That's it for this podcast. We're indebted to the crime writer Jan Bonderson for his meticulous research and scholarship. And we thoroughly recommend his book, Unsolved Murders of Women in Late Victorian London. It's available from Amazon and all good booksellers. My thanks to our team of super sleuths, Pip Watts and Carl Cooper, and our resident police homicide expert, Jack Morell. I'm Simon Ford, and we'll see you again soon on The Dark Side for another immersive psycho killer shocking true crime story. 